solutions in the adaptation community. So come on up here. We've got a, we have an audience live and also a lot is live streamed. And we're going to have a great session today. So my name is Craig Hansen. I am a vice president at the World Resources Institute. I oversee our work on food forest water in the ocean. I'm happy to be kind of the opener and the closer for today's session. Uh, today we're going to cover basically a really interesting issue that's kind of arisen over the past decade or so is that the emergence of kind of two communities. On the one hand, we have this community that's really focused on nature-based solutions, right? The conservation and restoration of nature for the sake of climate, right? This is the communities that look at, you know, forest conservation, wetland restoration, peatland restoration, et cetera. And, and you know, when you think about it, they kind of been focused on mitigation, right? Means of actually, you know, you know, reducing the, the GHGs in the atmosphere, right? Which is great. We need that. The world needs that. We need, and we need to do it. That community needs to, you know, get more traction faster. Nations need to be pursuing this nature-based solutions for mitigation ag agenda even faster. And we heard some great announcements on Tuesday this week, right? Kind of setting the agenda there in terms of commitments on avoided deforestation, large-scale financing for indigenous people's lands, right? The, 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 defend, the front line defenders of nature, etc. So that community is well established, moving along, but it's, you know, it's historically has been focused on climate mitigation. At the same time, we've been having a growing movement of a community that's looking at climate adaptation. I mean, we already realize, you know, climate change is already here. We have to start adapting now. And even if we actually got to zero emissions tomorrow, you know, there's built in momentum in terms of climate change, right? And so the world has to adapt, whether it's the farmers of the world, or the city manager of the world, they've got to you know, start figuring out how to adapt to the climate change that's already built into uh, the system. But for too often, I would argue, and that's the premise of this, of this today's event, is that those two communities have been a bit of never the twain shall meet, right? But interestingly, nature-based solutions is part of both, right? Think of wetland restoration, right? It's important for actually tackling climate change, you know, reducing emissions, sequestering carbon in the atmosphere. But at the same time, wetland restoration is a means of actual, of actually adaptation, right? Whether it's better management of water flows, you name it, right? So, it's some of the same solutions, right, are important for climate mitigation as well as climate adaptation. But for too long, those communities haven't met. So today's session is talking about how do we actually bridge those communities, and we're going to have a keynote presentation in just one moment. We're then going to dive into some case studies from Peru, India, and the United States, uh, looking at actually that, the bridging of the mitigation and adaptation communities. And finally, we're going to have a lively panelist discussion here where it's going to start addressing this question, but then go beyond, beyond talk to talk about implementation, right, in terms of bridging these two communities. So that's today's session. Um, so I'm looking forward to have, and we'll probably, if we have time, we'll actually have uh, time for some q and I'm hoping, uh, at the very end here for this, for this session. So to kick things off, it's my distinct pleasure and honor to bring it to the front of the stage here, Dr. John Matthews, who's the executive director and, and co-founder of the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation, uh, which is a global network that's developing, crowdsourcing, and mainstreaming the emerging practices of climate resilience especially with regard to water management. So, John, the floor is yours. Let's give him a round of applause. Can you hear me okay? Great. Super. Th thank you very much for the in introduction. It's a, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, we've been uh, Agua has been working with the WRI for many years on a wide variety of topics and, uh, uh, and some of what we're uh, going to be talking about today is uh, the, the product of some of the uh, really a kind of systemic, uh, systematic uh, exploration of, of these two issues about uh, adaptation and NBS and how we try to bring them together into a kind of common dialogue and I really like the word that uh, Craig was using there at, uh, right at the end about implementation. And I would say that what we need in order to do implementation is, is we really need uh, confidence. We need confidence and credibility uh, around both of these areas that there is a common agenda. If you could show the first slide, please. Thanks, Henry. So uh, I also, I, I didn't uh, uh, come up with a, with, a, with a title of the session, but I, I really love it, this idea of trying to find middle ground. Next slide, please. 
So uh, how, much, uh, how much money is really at stake uh, in terms of, of nature-based solutions in the kind of global conversation? This is part of a study that I, I was a part of uh, with a, 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 an FCDO pro, pro, uh, program called K4D that we published just about a year ago. And it was only looking at, at water issues. And this is an area that over the next uh, 10 or 20 years, we're expected to spend something like five to $10 trillion uh, around uh, infrastructure, around water alone. And to date, our best estimate is that only between one and 5% uh, uh, for uh, investment in, in global water has really been through NBS. It is a tiny, tiny uh, fraction right now of the current conversation. And I would say, you know, we can take it from an advocacy perspective, but actually the, the, uh, one of the significant issues I would say is that we're actually maybe artificially ruling a whole set of options out of the conversation. And how do we change that, that uh, conversation? Next slide, please. This is a, a, a uh, slide that came from the Global Commission on Adaptation, uh, also quite recently in September uh, 2019. Uh, WRI colleague uh, Carter Brandon was uh, w one of the key authors of this. And this is their, their kind of top line uh, set of recommendations uh, around how we think about the uh, kind of major areas of investment for climate adaptation. Strengthening early warning systems, making new, in infra new infrastructure resilient, improving dry land agriculture, uh, crop production, protecting mangroves, making water resources management more uh, uh, resilient. Now, I think actually uh, everything except for early warning systems should include profound uh, components of nature-based solutions. But these are, should be deeply integrated and some of them, like protecting mangroves, that is 100% uh, 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 nature-based solutions for adaptation. And these are very significant pots of money that they're talking about over a relatively short period of time that need to be uh, spent. And, and also what I think is the key word here is total net benefits, $7.1 trillion. And all but the 0.1 uh, in, in terms of early warning systems uh, should have a really significant, maybe even a primary component around nature-based solutions. Next slide, please. So. Uh, I, I'm a conservation biologist by training. Uh, I've been working on climate adaptation issues uh, since around 2003. And uh, I, I have, over the years, uh, collected a whole series of kind of uh, favorite uh, hypotheses that people have about why NBS uh, projects uh, uh, tend to fail in these uh, uh, types of conversations. And the first one that, that uh, I think the favorite one of most people is that we lack uh, evidence that NBS solutions actually work. Um, and, and it often is phrased as, let's wait for the scientists to, to tell us what to do. I'm a scientist, I'm telling you the evidence is there. That's actually, that, that doesn't exist as an issue. Uh, it's, it's not, that, that is uh, a very weak counter argument. Second, investors and lenders are not confident or familiar enough uh, with nature-based solutions. So there's a kind of low demand uh, on these topics. This, I, I just came literally a few minutes ago from a meeting with a special envoy from the Netherlands, uh, uh, Henko Vink, uh, and I, I, the, in uh, 2019, yes, uh, the Dutch straight, uh, state treasury uh, uh, issued a five billion euro nature-based solution green bond. It, it was oversubscribed by a factor of seven within five hours. They had to choose which of, of the, of the uh, people who were trying to, uh, to get a piece of this bond, because they considered it such a high value, confident bond uh, uh, that, that they had to prioritize uh, who actually got a piece. That, that's in impressive, that is, that is going to scale. This is a gigantic, it's one of the largest green bonds ever issued in history. Uh, it, 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 this, so this, I think, about investors uh, uh, and, and the finance community not being ready, I don't agree with that either. There's strong counter evidence uh, for some years that this hasn't been true. Second is engineers are not developing enough NBS projects. This is kind of low supply. There's some, somehow missing. Uh, and I, as a biologist, one of the most common conversations I've had over the past 15 years is, is uh, a young engineer very often a young a female engineer coming to me and saying, you need to help me, actually. 
you need, as a biologist, you need to help me know how I can use uh, ecosystems as infrastructure in our systems. This is the, this not an, an obstacle, I think, uh, on the engineering side either. I think they are, they're ready, they're willing, they're hungry, and maybe thirsty too uh, for, uh, for these kinds of projects. Second, we can't, uh, la uh, next to last, we can't easily assign economic value to ecosystem service. We, we need to wait for the latest tool that's always about six to nine months away uh, from now. And I don't agree with that either. Um, in Nagua, we worked uh, for about a two-year period with the Asian Development Bank to align their uh, NBS and adaptation programs. And they actually developed a whole series of processes inside the ADB actually just to be able to track uh, the economic benefits and co-benefits that were associated uh, with their NBS investments, uh, especially their hybrid investments, all across the Asia Pacific region. This is also something that's gone mainstream and is uh, being used throughout the ADB as well as many other types of financial institutions. And lastly, NBS projects are they're too small, they're too niche, and, and, and so especially investors maybe, maybe decision makers too, don't care. In this meeting that I was just having uh, with the Netherlands, sitting across the table uh, from Henko Vink was the Minister uh, for the Environment uh, from Ecuador. And uh, I, this was a conversation that I just helped mediate, and he started off saying in this conversation, we're new government, we've only been in office four months. Our largest priority right now is, is we see where our water towers are. They, they're, they are these uh, special wetlands in the Andes called Potamos. Potamos are actually, we have to secure these Potamos, these, these uh, high elevation wetlands uh, for the whole water security uh, of, of our economy going forward. We're starting with, I think he said 64,000 hectares that we're, we're trying to build a resilience program on and we're trying to move uh, within the next two years to 250,000 hectares. Uh, that is also going to scale. That is not niche. Uh, that is a very significant uh, type of project. Next slide, please. So what are some alternative hypotheses? What, what are maybe some of the real obstacles that we're facing? And I'd say that we often haven't thought about NBS as a kind of administrative and a process issue. We haven't thought about uh, the, the kind of project development cycle or how whole programs even kind of come up and frame uh, uh, infrastructure related solutions, climate adaptation solutions, climate adaptation policies, uh, and, and try to break it down into the individual steps. Like where do things fall out of the process? Where do good ideas need to start in order to be able to grow and flourish and, and move uh, uh, through that system? Um, so issues like procurement. Uh, very specific uh, tools around economic evaluation, how to compare uh, the, the, the benefits and costs between a gray, hybrid, and green options so that they can really be uh, viewed in, a, in, a, in an efficient and transparent way, and especially thinking about multi-purpose investments. I think that's something we're going to hear a lot in the examples today. Uh, a second big point is NBS are, should not be seen as a separate agenda. This, uh, this minister from Ecuador, he was talking about it as a, as a basic water and sanitation issue. It was a basic water supply issue uh, for the economy of Ecuador. He, he, he's, he was saying we need to bring ecosystems I into our economic uh, and even macroeconomic strategy. Um, that's uh, 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 seeing NBS as an asset and not something that we're, we're trying to, uh, to just bolt on uh, as a kind of secondary component. So it's linking NBS within broader agendas, especially climate adaptation, disaster risk management, a wash and agriculture. And I think one of the, the uh, points that a, a really good colleague of mine at the World Bank likes to say, you know, we, uh, adaptation is really about making better, more transparent, more clear trade-offs. And, and I think if we, if we can make them more transparent, actually we're gonna see that NBS rise and get through that project cycle much more often than they have been in many cases. Next slide, please. So how do we talk now about NBS and adaptation? And this is directly a, a part of some of the work that we've been doing uh, with WRI. And, and the first thing we did was we tried to divide up the, the kind of poles of uh, uh, the areas of discussion. And one was, of course, between NBS as a distinct uh, group of people uh, versus maybe the adaptation community. And also think of the people that are focused on Im implementation versus the people that are really focused on advocacy. And this is where we hear most of the noise, uh, including 
right here at the COP. It's, it's in this in, uh, NBS and advocacy space. These are often not the people that are really doing things. These are not the people that are managing budgets and projects. And this is where the money is, and this is where the money is growing. So uh, one of the speakers that you're going to hear uh, later today is from the Army Corps of Engineers. And they've just completed a five-year multi-institution, multi-country process to say we actually, uh, uh, that our gray infrastructure projects are insufficient. We are, are transforming our budgets and processes on the order of many billions uh, to make sure that we're working with and not against uh, natural, uh, ecological, hydrological, coastal geomorphological processes. That is a, a profound shift from people who were pouring concrete to saying that we need to work within and with these systems. So, and we also uh, think that uh, really uh, uh, one of the, the places that's often left out is this kind of funding and finance space. And it's, it is a kind of hinge point. We very purposely thought of it uh, right here in the middle, that it, it's, it's often the connector uh, and it's the, maybe the critical enabler uh, uh, to how we connect NBS and adaptation. Next slide, please. So some of our early work we've been with WRI, we've been surveying uh, a, a lot of different uh, types of institutions, some of the, the people that we think are at the edge uh, of this decision making. And uh, a, a very early insight that we had is uh, on the NBS side, they, they need a lot more climate assistance actually. They need to be able to think about climate risk. They need to essentially climate proof many of those NBS projects on the implementation side because ecosystems are already changing in response to climate. So we need to make sure that when we do an MBS project that it includes this climate risk component. Uh, we also need to think very much about on the adaptation side, are we doing things that artificially lop out hybrid and green options, uh, especially in early phase project development, kind of defining solution or divine, defining problems. So how do we make sure that more of those uh, I get introduced earlier in, in the decision-making process and that they are uh, uh, treated in a, in a uh, fair and comparable w manner. In both cases, this is really about integration of these two approaches. Next slide, please. This is a, a quote from uh, Lord Goldsmith. Uh, he's been kind of everywhere at, at this COP. This is from a statement that he made uh, a year ago, August. Uh, he's the UK Environment Minister, the FCDO Minister. Um, and uh, he, I think, was really making a nice point about this difference between uh, advocacy or investment. Our recent research suggests that the odds are currently stacked against infrastructure investment in nature due to our procedures. Uh, that it's almost a kind of technical administration issue for many institutions. And while now is the time to accelerate the use of nature-based solutions, we do need to rebalance the scale so that natural options are considered equally alongside traditional infrastructure. This is a, a very powerful message from a powerful person. And I, I would summarize, summarize it. I'm, I'm from Texas in, in, the, in the US. We're a very plain spoken uh, state in the US that can we get the BS out of NBS? And we need to actually like, make it real. We need to make it really practical. Uh, and, 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 and not, not focus so much on the advocacy. There's enough advocacy out there. We need to focus on the investment. Next slide, please. So uh, where, where, where do we see convergence or divergence? I think the larger story is that we, uh, we're clearly seeing a lot of convergence. On the adaptation side, there are some of the key insights that people have been making have been around systems thinking. Uh, trying to uh, open up the boundaries of, of problems so that we look across it and we look much more holistically. That's, that's a revolution that's happening in fields like planning and uh, engineering. Uh, the issue of deep uncertainty, that we don't have data from the future, that it's very difficult uh, now to think with a lot of confidence, with the kind of specificity that we thought we were comfortable with, that we thought that we really needed in the past, to say this is exactly what the climate's going to look like in 10, 20, 50 years, the, the operational lifetime of most pieces of infrastructure, that we need to design in some fundamentally different ways that can work with uncertainty. And then lastly, trying to redefine some of the solutions that, that if we have new problems, then we probably need new solutions too. Uh, on the NBS side, that, that community is also uh, changing rapidly. Uh, and I think Craig actually said this very well at the beginning, that a lot of our work today, uh, uh, up until now, has been focused, it's really traditional conservation work. That we're 
uh, rebranding or modifying or adjusting in often some small ways to talk about adaptation. And the kind of key word there is around co-benefits, that, that the main thing is actually nature and the second part is probably thinking about how we track often in a qualitative way what, what the benefits uh, are, uh, are from adaptation from those ecosystems. But if we're going to think, if we're going to engage with this group, we probably need to move to this level, which is thinking of ecosystems as infrastructure. And, and, and that means that we need to actually think of them in terms of, of uh, uh, quantitative approaches. What, in the same way that we have a, the performance that we evaluate in very careful economic structural ways uh, for an irrigation project, we need to do the same thing for uh, a, a nature-based flood control project. Next slide, please. So do we need NBS in the NDCs? Um, I'm hoping that uh, one of the next speakers, uh, Jan, uh, will uh, talk about this. Uh, and this here, uh, uh, our organization, Agua, one of the areas that we work on a lot is in the space of uh, 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 supporting more credible, uh, more uh, robust NDCs, trying to make them really effective, uh, especially using water as a kind of filter or lens to kind of coordinate and make more coherent the NDCs. And one of the big issues that's not captured in most NDCs is this idea that the things that we're building right now, that they're going to confront conditions that, they, that we haven't really seen before. Regardless of, of, a, of our carbon mitigation targets, that they're, they're just going to face some, um, some really extreme climate conditions. And deep resilience is a new approach that, uh, that, that we've started to see kind of emerging as a, as a pattern and a broad strategy. Deep resilience is something that we think of as an answer to deep uncertainty, that it's multi-layered, flexible, and integrated solutions to climate problems. And nature-based solutions actually fit really well with these kind of multi-layered uh, uh, approaches uh, to thinking about infrastructure. We're trying to lump a whole bunch of problems, say, around uh, uh, energy production, agriculture, and disaster risk reduction, Nature-based solutions are easily kind of span those kind of problem sets. Next slide, please. And uh, maybe my, my most important point is that we really need to think about finance not just as a way to pay for things, it's actually the way to kind of communicate how we do things and what the new expectations are. And that's all kinds of uh, financial flows. Uh, this is, uh, for instance, the same certification system from uh, the Climate Bonds Initiative. Uh, uh, they, they came out a number of years ago. Uh, for instance, the city of uh, Cape Town issued a 250 million uh, rand uh, a, a green bond that had integrated nature-based solutions inside of it. There's a very famous bond that, that came out maybe three or four years ago in this space. And in, it, this was something that it, it told the city of Cape Town and it also told investors, you can have the confidence and credibility to actually invest in this as a sound project, the same as a, as, as a concrete project. Next slide, please. I'm going to end just with a, a quote uh, from a, a colleague of mine. He's been working at, at the edge of this work for many years at the University of Georgia. And, and I was teaching a class a few years ago. And, and to the students in the class, he said, what if we could design a seawall that could heal itself? And, and he answered his own question. He said, we can. It's called a sand dune. And, and that's just a very simple but powerful observation that we need to think of, of, of our solutions in a, in a really different way than we have in the past. Last slide, please. Thank you so much, and I, I look forward to hearing the, the, the other speakers. Thank you, John. That was great. I, it's just three things on there. I, um, I learned a lot from this. One, one was, I love it when, you, when people lay out the question, they start to question long-held hypotheses or beliefs, your, your, your slides, you said, well, this is what we've always thought about what's holding it back. But in reality, it's this over here. So I love that. That's great. Secondly, I loved your slide where you said that the nature-based solutions community needs to make themselves more climate proof. And the adaptation community makes, makes to, needs to find greener options, right? That with the arrows. And that's really what this bridging is about. And finally, I love the fact that you said coastal geomorphological. It's not every day you hear those words, let alone the same sentence. So thank you for that. Um, so next up, we have uh, my colleague here, um, to bring up here to the top here, Rebecca Carter, who's the Acting Director for the Climate Resilience Practice at WRI. She also was 
part and parcel and really helped make the success of the Global Commission on Adaptation. So to take things forward with this next set of sessions, I hand everything over to Rebecca. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Craig. And thanks so much, John, as well, for getting us off to a great start. So I have the pleasure now of introducing three case studies that will look at different aspects of nature-based solutions for adaptation. Uh, the first is from Jan Kassen, who is um, working on natural infrastructure for water security. So she's going to talk about a forest trends project in Peru. And maybe I'll mention also that she leads the organization's work on scaling nature-based solutions for sustainable water management and climate solutions. Um, she's an ecologist by, with expertise in terrestrial and freshwater systems, and her career has emphasized applied research and practice in a wide range of water resource management issues. Jan, please go ahead and share your case study. Inviting me to this really important session. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a project that we're working on in, in Peru, where we've been supporting um, the government of Peru and communities in Peru on scaling um, natural infrastructure solutions for water security. And I just want to note that this is a project that involves a lot of partners. We're leading a consortium of partners um, with the support of USAID in Canada. Um, but a lot of the leadership is coming from ministries within Peru. The government of Peru has taken um, significant leadership in these issues over the years. And communities in Peru as well are part of this, um, this collaboration. So I'll just talk a little bit about um, the ways that I think nature-based solutions and adaptation communities really are aligned in Peru and, and how that is, is probably going to increase in the future. And before I talk about kind of the, the steps um, through which this alignment has happened in Peru, I just want to suggest a couple of factors that I think have really fostered this alignment. And a lot of these echo um, the points that um, Craig and John were making. First, there's a very strong concern for resilience in Peru. Um, not just the resilience of natural systems, but individuals, communities, and society, and economies, importantly. And I think one of the things that's a little bit maybe unique about Peru is the focus on resilient water systems as a key to resilience in other sectors. And also, um, the view of nature as critical part of a nation's infrastructure. I think this is a point that John made with ecosystems as infrastructure, this view that natural infrastructure is really important to the nation is something that I think is somewhat unique still, certainly on the part of, of government decision makers. Um, and finally, I think there's a recognition that nature-based solutions can be a path to more systemic interlocking and cross-sectoral solutions, um, in John's terms, to deep resilience, really a path to deep resilience. So I'll try to quickly run through um, kind of four of the steps that I think were important in this alignment in Peru. Um, the first is um, a focus on resilient water systems. And there's a growing recognition over the last couple of decades on the part of leaders in the water sector, um, Lima's water utility Setapal, the national regulator SUNAS, and the National Water Authority, as well as communities that are kind of on the front line of the water crisis that watershed degradation, the loss of these um, natural grasslands and high altitude wetlands have really impacted the reliability of water supplies and and led to increasing risk to um, resilient water supplies for the community downstream. And this recognition led really through the leadership of the water sector um, to national level policies and significant financing for natural infrastructure investment in the watersheds of every major utility in the country. So. This is an example of the, these solutions were supported by the traditional conservation community, but um, really driven by the water sector. And secondly, there's a concern for the resilience of uh, smallholder farmers, farming communities, and economies, particularly in some of the upper watersheds. And led by the Ministry of Agriculture, there's a significant program in water and harvesting that again uses nature-based solutions but importantly, a combination of hybrid green and gray solutions, and also um, really tapping into Peru's tradition of ancestral nature-based water management practices. So the, the Amunas that are um, really nature-based managed aquifer recharge um, solutions, 
So this is significant investment in um, integrated green and gray solutions for water resilience. And again, supported by the conservation community and the, and the traditional nature-based solutions community, but really driven by the agriculture community. Um, third, there's a concern for resilience of communities and gray infrastructure in the face of increasing natural disasters in Peru. In 2017, with the El Nino Costero storms, there was significant um, loss of life and damage to gray infrastructure, water and sanitation systems, roads and energy systems um, from landslides and flooding. And, and that really spurred um, a large program, the Reconstruction with Changes program, which is Peru's Build Back Better, which is focused on not just recovering from these disasters and repairing some of the damage from the disasters, but really taking an integrated approach to building a deeper resilience in these um, vulnerable coastal watersheds to increasing hazards from climate change, but also building that resilience in a way that supports local communities and livelihoods and economies. And again, through the lens of, of water. So this is a multi-billion dollar program that really takes an integrated approach to watershed resilience and explicitly for the first time, I think in a disaster um, risk mitigation program, explicitly calling out the role of nature-based solutions as part of um, an integrated um, disaster risk management strategy. And then finally, I just um, try to describe a little bit of the way that nature-based solutions are becoming really embedded in Peru's adaptation measures. So with this, with this figure, I just really tried to show um, the way that some of the common interventions in the nature-based solutions portfolio that Peru has been implementing are directly related to a number of the adaptation measures that they have identified across multiple sectors. So on the right are a number of the adaptation measures that were defined for the water sector, but also for the agriculture sector. And it's, it's really clear that by integrating nature-based solutions within an adaptation portfolio, you can address multiple adaptation measures across multiple sectors with a single nature-based solutions, but with a portfolio of these solutions is really getting at that interlocking cross-sectoral, more systemic solutions that really can be a path to deep resilience, as John mentioned. And so finally, I think just to reiterate a little bit, I think this this alliance and alignment is really emerging in Peru and is a, a model for other places. And it really, I think, relies on having a water resilience lens for adaptation and recognizing that role of nature as critical infrastructure. And since many of our adaptation plans focus on climate proofing infrastructure and making infrastructure more resilient to climate change, really thinking about nature as infrastructure is important for that that integration. And then again, embedding nature-based solutions as a more systemic solution and really as, as enabling this path to deep resilience. But there are challenges and some of the things that, that John mentioned are really important, I think, for us to acknowledge as a nature-based solutions community. And that is that the, the nature-based solutions are vulnerable to climate change. And there's deep uncertainty around the ways that climate change will affect the nature-based solutions, as well as the natural systems that they're based on. And we're gonna be faced with novel changes in these um, solutions that we, we're gonna need to plan for and be able to, to adapt to. Um, and I think part of this is making sure that the individual interventions that we design as nature-based solutions really are, that their own resilience is considered as well as the resilience of the larger landscape in which they're embedded. So I will, Close with that. Thanks very much. And um, there's some additional contacts from our team based in Peru if, if you're interested in additional information on the project. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jan. That was a really encouraging case study, I think, about how NBS is possible. It is possible to move beyond the rhetoric and the big talk to actual implementation. But the challenges and uncertainty remain. Um, our next case study will be from my colleague at WRI India, um, Sahil Kanakar. He is a senior associate in our Urban Development and Resilience Program with our Sustainable Cities and Urban Transport team at WRI India. 
His work focuses on green-blue infrastructure, nature-based solutions toward flood risk management, and strategic planning for long-term climate resilience. He deals with multi-scalar integrated approaches by applying global and local knowledge and facilitating multiple stakeholders. Thanks so much for being with us, Sahil, and uh, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, the, the nature-based solutions, especially in, in the context of Mumbai. And like in the beginning, what uh, Greg and John and even uh, Jan was talking about that, it's not only about the nature-based solutions, but the adaptation and adaptation towards the climate risks. So briefly, I'll first walk through the, the risks, what exactly the risk is in, in the context of Mumbai and what is the vulnerable aspect in that. And based on that, what exactly is happening uh, when we talk about the nature-based solutions within that context? So as, yeah. so as most of us know, Mumbai is ranked seventh largest in the world in terms of its population. But under the IPCC's business as usual scenario, Mumbai finds itself to be the second in the list of cities at risk from sea level rise and extreme weather events. With more than 22 million inhabitants in the metropolitan region and serving as India's financial center, it accounts for more than 6% of India's economic output. Having said that, the risk for Mumbai, its residents, and even the Indian economy is immense. Being a peninsula surrounded by sea on three sides and separated from the mainland by a creek and a harbor, the geographic conditions and the fact that it was created by reclaiming waterlogged areas between these seven islands is one of the reasons for city being flooded during the monsoon season. Since past decades, city is witnessing a changing rainfall pattern with increasing intensities spread over short durations. For instance, almost four extremely heavy rainfall events have been recorded in a year and four cyclones in past five years. On the screen, you can see the simulation which shows the impact of rising global temperatures and the inundation that would be seen within the, the context of Mumbai. So other than coastal flooding and erratic rainfall patterns, Mumbai is also witnessing increasing temperatures. It is the least green city in India with the lowest per capita green cover and has witnessed reduction of almost 40% of the green cover in past three decades. During the same period, the mean land surface temperature has increased, especially in the areas with lesser green cover. The graph on the left shows the vegetation cover in each ward. Now, ward is the smallest administrative unit within the municipal corporation of Mumbai and how the surface temperature is high within the least green ward. This has a major impact on citizens health with increased cases related to heat, respiratory difficulties and heat strokes. The demographic diversity of the city with varying socioeconomic backgrounds adds to the complexity of understanding the vulnerable and resilient capacities amongst the community. Nearly 41% of the total population of the city lives in these slum conditions and are vulnerable to flood and heat hazards. The map over here shows how the temperature in the Dharavi area, which is one of the slums, is almost four to five degrees warmer than the surrounding neighborhood. And this has multiple reasons. I mean, roofing material, congested building densities, but most importantly, it is the lack of green cover. Mumbai is rich in its ecological assets with the presence of rivers, creeks, mangroves, and forests within the city limit itself. So as a response to these climate risks, Mumbai as a city is actively working towards restoration and protection of this, this ecology and turning its forests and other natural areas for nature-based solutions. However, there are challenges in adoption and operationalization of these nature-based solutions due to lack of awareness, available capacities and governance models. Further to add to this earlier, how it was mentioned uh, as well, that access to fund and understanding the financial modalities are, are also remain as a key barrier. Now, fortunately, there has been a strong political momentum towards nature-based solution in case of Mumbai. One of such political push has been the R.A. Milk Colony case. Now, R.A. Milk Colony is, is one of the urban forests within the eco-sensitive zone of Sanjay Gandhi National Park, and it acts as a buffer between the national park and the city. About 190 acres of forest was planned for development of a metro car share, and trees were felled in the process, preceding citywide protests to protect the last few areas of this natural forest. However, in October 2020, the Maharashtra State Chief Minister declared 800 acres of the land within this RA as a reserve forest, relocating this metro car shed to a different part of the city. Now, this seminal decision marked the government's and city's co commitment 
to protect its forest reserves. Now, when it comes to mainstreaming nature-based solutions within the city building process, integrating this approach in the existing urban development policies is very critical. One such example is amendment of the Maharashtra Tree Protection and Conservation Act. Now, what this amendment is doing is that it is protecting the old trees by declaring them with a heritage status, that thereby preventing them from felling and uprooting, no matter what the development priority is. And there have been stringent laws and penalties set in place for violation of the same and a tree authority to monitor as well. Similar to this, there are regulations in place to protect mangrove wetlands, which act as natural flood protection system for the coast of Mumbai. Other policies, other than policies, financial mechanisms and mobilizing funds are the biggest challenge to mainstream nature-based solutions. Associating with the existing schemes, now for, for instance over here, it's the state government's Maji Vasundra, which literally translates to my planet. Now this is an initiative which promotes ecosystem restoration and conservation. Now what Municipal Corporation of Mumbai has done is that it has managed to get funds through this initiative and has planted around 162,000 native trees with, with a variety of around 460 different species. So now this is not only increasing the green cover within the city, but is also improving the biodiversity and increasing the carbon sequestration capacity of the city. Now, integrating open space design within city's gray infrastructure is one of the important principles of nature based solutions, thereby increasing city's resilience and adaptive capacities, let's say. Such similar example is, is Mahim Beach Nourishment Project, done through the political will of the local leaders and the ward officers, which not only prevents coastal erosion through the way the, the beach has been developed, but it also adds to the new recreation destination within the city. Now, similarly, an existing sports and culturally significant open space is Shivaji Park in Mumbai, which is being developed with the rainwater harvesting facilities, which would increase the permeability and water holding capacity within the neighborhood. Now, integrating with the grey infrastructure, this is one of the initiatives that further can be taken, where this uh, uh, natural asset can be integrated with the stormwater drainage system, and, and the, the, this can be an integrated approach, let's say. Now, administration and governance for nature-based solution requires coherence in policies and various departments as well. Mumbai has established its first ever biodiversity committee with the inclusion of department, different department heads and expert consultants which is actually a great opportunity for the city to institutionalize nature-based solutions. While all these developments are taking place, the city is also developing its strategic roadmap by working on its first climate, uh, climate action plan after becoming part of C40's uh, cities in December 2020. Further in July 2021, Mumbai also joined Cities for Forest Initiative, where Municipal Corporation is involving the citizens as well in this process. With these two relevant global platforms, Mumbai is working towards a more scientific approach to tackle its heat and flood risk with a data-driven, inclusive, and integrated approach. The newfound political support for nature-based solution has acted as a kickstart needed to spur such approach, access funding for implementation, and develop capacity and a shared agenda between the stakeholders. With all this said, there is a great opportunity Mumbai, uh, which Mumbai has to mainstream nature-based solutions in its infrastructure development and management as, as a long-term uh, strategy. So yeah, that's that's it from, from my end in, in terms of the Mumbai case. Uh, thank you. Great, thanks so much, Sahil. I, that was a really interesting look at how one of the world's largest cities faces some really daunting challenges with adaptation, but also the emerging evidence that nature-based solutions make a difference. I mean, being able to see the correlation, for example, between temperatures and greenness, you know, I think is exactly the type of data that we need more of to advance this, this type of work. Uh, so moving on to our final panelist, I'd like to welcome, sorry, technical difficulty. Uh, I'd like to welcome, there we go, Dr. Candace, Candace Piercy who is with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, she is a research environmental engineer with 11 years of experience as the co-lead of the Integrated Ecological Monitoring Team at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Her research focus is on the stimulation of feedbacks between ecological and physical processes, primarily driven by vegetation in a variety of ecosystems, including salt marshes, dunes, estuaries, and river floodplains. She also conducts field monitoring studies and helps develop ecologically informed engineering guidance for coastal ecos ecosystems. Dr. Piercy, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, so 
uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on the organization I work for. So I work for the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center, which is the research and development arm of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And today I'll be speaking about how we can utilize the principles of the course Engineering with Nature Initiative to facilitate adaptation through the use of nature-based solutions. So about 40% of the U.S. population near, lives near the coast, and globally about 50% live within three kilometers of a surface freshwater body. So in the upper left map, you can see just some of the major inland and coastal deep draft ports in the U.S., which indicates how important access to water is for commerce, fishing, agriculture, drinking water, et cetera. But when we have such a high proportion of our population living close to water, we really need to understand how climate change uh, will affect our flood risk. So in the lower left, you will see a plot of how climate change has combined with economic growth to make the impacts of prior storms like Hurricanes Katrina and Andrew far more likely into the future. So there's really five or so strategies, depending on who you talk to, for addressing flood risk. Um, and they really utilize this militaristic language. Um, so like advance the line, hold the line. It's almost like we're in a battle with nature. So um, we have uh, the, for instance, the Army Corps uses this, uh, flood fighting as a term for what we're what we're doing when when we are in the middle of a flood event. So it really implies that if we don't win, that means we're losers. And if we so if we choose retreat, it implies defeat. Um, but we can't continue providing flood risk management like we have have in the past. So of these options, we really can go ahead and eliminate advanced line. The, the days of reclamation for agriculture are really over. And equally unacceptable is the do nothing. We can't just not uh, have inaction. We can't leave people in harm's way where, until they're displaced by the next disaster. So the Army Corps and other organizations like, like us um, really have held this sort of hold the line position. However, that's increasingly becoming untenable. So we really need to start looking at how we can adapt. We need to look at whether or not we can support people living in risky locations and start to look at how we can uh, accommodate or retreat um, as more and more uh, as sea levels rise, as we start seeing more uh, at-risk flood-prone areas. So we can utilize the principle of engineering with nature to help facilitate adaptation in these flood prone areas. So engineering with nature as an initiative seeks to find sustainable solutions to engineering problems by balancing the economic, environmental, and social needs around infrastructure. Engineering with nature principles can be implemented as part of a comprehensive flood risk management solution through the use of nature-based solutions. And these nature-based solutions are really designed to benefit both people and nature. So they're dual purpose. Um, and I will note that while the focus of this, of this talk is on flood hazard, we will um, be looking at how climate change is forcing us to grapple with other hazards like fire and heat waves um, or rain on burn or rain on snow events that have caused some catastrophic floods and, and landslides in the past. So you can see some, just some of the benefits of a nature-based solution um, on this slide. However, for flood risk management pro projects, you really want to focus on their adaptability and their sustainability. And also looking at how additional co-benefits associated with nature-based solutions can bring additional partners to the table and even potentially additional funding. So what's the core doing in the realm of nature-based solutions? So I got a plug earlier. Um, in September, the, the Engineer Research and Development Center, the ERDIC, in collaboration with over 70 organizations from the public, private, and NGO sectors across the world released this natural and nature-based feature guideline for flood risk management. So 
Natural and nature-based features, NNBFs, are a type of nature-based solution. They're not the only one, but they're just a type. And these are really natural features in the landscape that confer um, some sort of flood risk through reduction of erosion, water levels, velocities, or waves. And they, um, they exist in coastal and fluvial systems and can be used alone or in combination with other measures like conventional great infrastructure or non-structural measures like uh, structure elevation or uh, buyouts. So this guideline really lays out how to think about NNBF as part of FRM. And we also provide the state of the practice and science on the use of specific types of NNBFs in both coastal and fluvial systems. And um, it is available for download if you go to the Engineering with Nature website, which is listed at the bottom there. My computer's lagging, I'm sorry. <laughs> so the guideline itself advocates thinking about how the benefits and costs associated with NNBF um, in a really comprehensive way. So if we use a traditional single purpose approach, uh, flood risk management project may be justified solely on the flood risk benefit versus the monetary cost. Um, however, from if we want to look at a holistic life cycle management perspective, we really need to broaden that view of these nature-based assets to include other types of benefits and other types of impacts. So one way we can we can do that is, in, is look at the co-benefits these produce, these are through habitat, recreation, carbon sequestration, water quality improvement, et cetera. Um, but we also need to look at impacts of our infrastructure decisions. So we already consider that a little bit through um, traditional environmental mitigation. So, but we also need to look at some of the hidden impacts, which might include material manufacturing, um, carbon emissions, and disposal. Um, and disposal is an interesting one because uh, there was a recent paper in Nature that looked at the total global mass of manufactured materials. And in 2020, it exceeded all global biomass. And the vast majority of that manufactured mass is actually concrete. Um, so we can use natural and nature-based features as a way to curtail our need for concrete and adaptation and all of the associated uh, emissions and uh, other negative effects as associated with concrete production and disposal. So I just want to switch to one application of uh, nature-based solutions in an Army Corps flood risk management project. So there was a series of coastal storm risk management feasibility studies that were authorized by Congress following Hurricane Sandy. And this one in particular focuses on the Back Bay Lagoons of New Jersey. So these are the areas behind the barrier islands. And in a, lo a large proportion of the area, um, the project team has slated these uh, non-structural solutions. So um, in these areas, there will be no surge barriers blocking the inlets. There will be no flood walls. There will be no levees. Um, instead, they're going to rely on things like structure elevation, buyouts, advanced evacuation and flood warning systems. So the, the project planning team asked the research scientists and engineers here at URDIC how nature-based solutions, specifically the use of natural wetland features and smaller NNBFs could be used to facilitate adaptation. So give, give a minute for the computer to catch up. <laughs> um, one of the main questions the planning team had and the stakeholders was how projected marsh loss might affect future flood risk. So in the left map, you see uh, uh, all of the sort of bluish green colors are salt marsh in the central region um, where the, this inlet is going to be open, left open. Um, however, in projections for 2080, which is the 50 year planning horizon, we're expecting a lot of that area to convert to mud flat. So all of those yellow regions are places where we're expecting salt marsh to convert to mud flat. So what, unlike some of the previous studies that have just sort of compared the uh, flood risk with presence absence of marsh, um, we were asked to look at the effects of marsh management as an adaptation me mechanism to determine if there's flood risk management 
manage blood risk management benefits of reducing the effects of sea level, sea level rise through the implementation of um, erosion control through um, green breakwaters, uh, living shorelines, and facilitating um, marsh migration either through creating these marsh migration strategic marsh migration corridors or just like completely removing barriers to marsh migration. So um, while this is an in-progress study, we are uh, currently developing these models, modeling scenarios now, and we really are hoping that we can show how conservation can be used in a way um, to support flood risk management benefits. So I will try to wrap up quickly. Um, with some closing thoughts on how nature-based solutions can be a cost-effective means of adaptation and what barriers remain. So um, from that same paper that I shared in the beginning from Borja Ruggiero um, at University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, they've really shown that nature-based solutions can be cost-effective. However, um, nature-based solutions really require space, and that can lead to conflict. Um, so, conflict might include social equity, loss of community cohesion, and cultural value of land. Uh, a recent paper um, looked at marsh migration and conflict with social interests in the Chesapeake Bay, and we really need to contend with these issues and find ways to ensure that adaptation measures are equitable, and we really need to overcome the perception that we're kicking people out of their homes off their land just to like plant a bunch of daisies or something. Um, we also need to keep in mind that land acquisition is very costly and that's often the reason projects may eliminate buyout options and getting people out of harm's way. Um, we have complex regulatory and legal hurdles to overcome for, for many of these measures. Um, it's important to also remember that uh, adaptation takes time and when we're dealing with the federal government in the U.S. especially, uh, bureaucracy moves very slowly. And if we want to move forward with a diverse stakeholder group, things will take will go even slower, especially at first. So, we need to, but we need to also realize that nature-based solutions can be incremental and scalable. So we don't need to necessarily start at the 100% solution. We can start at a 10% and ramp up from there. We really need to also get better at capturing the full array of costs and benefits associated with our flood risk management decisions. Because if we continue to ignore the co-benefits and ideally net reduction in environmental impacts of our infrastructure, we will not make progress. And we'll continue to rely on concrete and steel, even if it's not the optimal solution. So if you have any additional questions or want more information, please visit our Engineer with Nature website, or you can email me with any questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Candice. Really interesting to hear the sort of evolution and perspective over time um, from that war fitting to something closer to, you know, more accommodation, more recognition that the challenges are going to require different types of solutions than we might have thought of in the past. So I would like to move on now to our panel discussion. Um, and I guess maybe this session is a little bit unusual in that we have the three of us here in person and everyone else is online, but maybe this is sort of the shape of cops to come. Did you have a question? Okay. Yeah. I, in the interest of time, I think we're going to have to hold all the questions till the end so that our panelists get a chance to speak. Sorry about that. We're a bit behind schedule. Um, so I'd like to first introduce Roman Mendeley with the California Department of Water Resources. He is a senior water resources engineer, and is leading the Climate Action Plan Phase 2, which is aiming to improve the consistency and scientific rigor of the Department of Water Resources approaches for analyzing climate change's potential impacts while preserving both project management flexibility and efficiency. Our second panelist will be Astrid Michaels from GIZ. She's a program manager and currently leads the regional program Scaling Up Ecosystem-Based Adaptation in Rural Latin America. This program, which is funded by the International Climate Change Initiative, aims to increase climate resilience in vulnerable communities and ecosystems in rural areas of Ecuador, Guatemala, and Costa Rica. An ecologist by training, Astrid's work aims to support countries in integrating climate change adaptation policies into sustainable water and natural resources management. 
Our third panelist is Zach Knight with Blue Forest. He is the co-founder and the CEO of Blue Forest. Prior to founding it, he started his career in finance at Merrill Lynch, where he spe specialized in structured finance. Um, at Blue Forest, Zach leads the outreach program with foundations and conservation, the conservation finance community, as well as engagement with the US Forest Service and the state of California. I'd also like to introduce Kari Vigerstahl from the Nature Conservancy. She's the Director of Water Security and Science and Innovation for the Nature Conservancy's Global Water Program, which is working to strategically strengthen and advance the science behind the Conservancy's water resource protection and water scarcity strategies. She, she also leads their corporate water stewardship work, advancing collective action in critical, in critical basins around the world. Um, and I'd like to start off with a, pan a question for all of our panelists. I don't know if it's possible to put the panelists on the screen. No, okay. Um, so this question is for all of our panelists, and I would encourage you to keep your answers to two minutes or less. Um, could you please give just a brief overview of your work and how it fits into the NBS for Adaptation space? Um, I don't know which panelists we should have on come on first. I don't think it matters if it's for all of them. Just pick one. Uh, okay, let's let's start with uh, Romaine Mendley. Good. Uh, I say good morning because we're in California, but I guess it's afternoon there. So uh, it's wonderful to be here with everybody in this panel, and I'm very humbled to be part of this event associated with uh, COP26. Uh, I might be an engineer, but I grew up in small alpine village in Switzerland, playing in the creeks and local environments, and my bachelor is in environmental engineering science. So. While I have a very uh, technical background, uh, I always have the environmental on, my, on, the, on the back of my mind. Uh, I'm currently working with the California Department of Water Resources, leading the climate change technical work in the department. Uh, the department is a large organization with between four to 5,000 employees. We are working on water supply reliability. Uh, we are providing water to 40 million people in Southern California. We are um, working on flood risk management. We are leading the implementation of Central Valley Flood Protection Plan, which provides recommendations to protect hundreds of billions of dollars in assets and uh, multi multiple millions of, of people. And then on the ecosystem announcements, uh, the state is rich in unique ecosystem and most of the uh, of of water in California converts to the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. It's the largest freshwater tidal estuary of its kind in the west coast of, of the Americas. And so the work, that I'm, work that, that I'm doing in general is, is touching on everything uh, from planning documentation, operational maintenance, regulatory requirements, and implementation of projects. And so I'm constantly thinking about how um, the application of climate change analysis are going to impact our activities and trying to find and develop process which improve the consistency and scientific rigor uh, for the departments of the water sources. There's two projects I want to highlight. Uh, that's flood bypass and, and flood mar. So flood bypass, I think everybody knows, is like really to remove water from the system to um, to kind of reduce flood risk um, in the valley, on the California Central Valley. Uh, we have the Yolo Bypass and the Paradise Cut. Some of the Yolo Bypass work is being implemented right now. On the Paradise Cut side, um, we are in the design phase, and, and it's really a, a nature-based solution in my mind. The second one I think I'm the most aware of is the Flood Manager Aquifer Recharge. So the concept here is to look at the headwater down to the groundwater, figure out how to capture flood flows to recharge groundwater. And, um, you know, by recharging your water, you are providing uh, environmental benefits um, to ecosystems where are dependent to groundwater, also returning flood flows uh, or natural flows through the rivers. And so I think we are very successful at showing how we can integrate water management and provide uh, natural, uh, natural based solutions. Great. Thanks very much, Roman. And now I'd like to ask the same question of Astrid Michaels from GIZ. So can you give us, in two minutes, uh, a brief overview of your work and how it fits into the NBS for Adaptation space? Yes, hello. Um, I'm very happy to join you from Costa Rica, where I'm coordinating a regional program funded by the German Ministry of Environment under the International Climate Initiative on scaling up ecosystem-based adaptation in rural areas of Latin America. We're working together with the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, IUCN, and uh, CATIE, the Tropical Agricultural Research Center. What are we doing? 
in three countries, in Guatemala, Ecuador, and Costa Rica, we're enhancing the resilience for vulnerable communities in rural areas and ecosystem. And what does it mean? It means in our work, we're trying to ensure, to boost the provision and regulation of ecosystem services, for example, by increasing water availability and reducing climate related risks from flood and drought and addressing biodiversity loss. In Guatemala, we work in the dry corridor where low precipitation rates lead to low uh, uh, water availability and we support smallholder farmers in preparing for that, uh, for example, through irrigation adaptation strategies. In Costa Rica and Ecuador, we work in agricultural sectors, working on cacao, coffee, but also ecotourism. And water security is a cross-cutting issue for us. So how does my work relate to nature-based solutions? Nature-based solution as a paradigm concept um, within this, we work on the scalability of ecosystem-based adaptation. And hereby we're working on, in the, on the enabling environment, integrating in all these three countries, ecosystem-based adaptation in policies, strengthening capacities at all different levels, working on good examples that can be scaled up and most importantly working on developing innovating financing mechanisms and especially also enhancing the access to these financing mechanisms a big part or an important aspect of that is also knowledge sharing among those three countries because there are uh, projects concepts that work in one context and can be adapted to another one thank you Great, thanks very much, Astrid. Um, and I'd like to, to ask Zach, now, Zach Knight to speak for just a few minutes about um, the, an overview of his work and how it fits into the NBS for Adaptation space. Zach? Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It is indeed quite humbling. Uh, my name is Zach Knight. I'm CEO and co-founder of Blue Forest. And we're a conservation finance firm that's focused on natural infrastructure in the Western US. Um, as a nonprofit, I think it's important to share where our funding comes from. We're pretty evenly funded between private foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation uh, and the U.S. federal government with funding coming from the Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Forest Service and the EPA. And our first financial product is the Forest Resilience Bond. It's a public-private partnership that was created with the World Resources Institute and the U.S. Forest Service. And what we do in this public-private partnership is bringing capital from private investors that could include insurance companies, pension plans, family offices, or even foundations to cover the upfront costs of ecological restoration in our Western forests with the goal of reducing the risk of catastrophic wildfire. We've heard a lot about co-benefits and these projects produce a lot of co-benefits. So what this model does is it engages with all the beneficiaries, including the US Forest Service, but also water and electric utilities, flood control districts, state agencies, and actually even corporates in our newest project and they pay for the benefits they receive through this financing. And that's what ultimately repays our investors. Uh, we launched our first pilot project back in 2018. It was a $4 million forest restoration project on the Tahoe National Forest. And just last week, we closed uh, another project that will finance over $25 million of restoration in that same watershed with the same stakeholders, many of the same contracts. So it's really nice to see this work scaling up. Last point I'll mention here is the investor demand for this has been significant because this really is the first investment that creates a return for investors while supporting the management of our public lands here in the US. Uh, thanks so much, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to the panel. Great, thanks, thanks very much, Zach. And Kari, let me turn to you now. Um, same question, brief overview of your work and how it fits into the NBS for Adaptation space. Great, thanks so much, Rebecca, and wonderful to be with you all today with these other um, fantastic speakers. So at the Nature Conservancy, um, NBS for Net Adaptation is a core element of, of many of our strategies, crossing over freshwater health, regenerative agriculture, community-based conservation, coastal management, among others. We focus both on project development and implementation, but then also um, addressing some of those barriers to, to scaling that John mentioned and others have, have spoken about. Um, and I focus on NBS for water security, um, particularly how these types of interventions can help people in nature be resilient in the face of unprecedented change. 
And through our water resilient, uh, resilient watershed strategy, which is sort of a 2.0 of water funds, if people have heard of that before, we are aiming to scale nature-based solutions across source watersheds um, as a key component of the solution set to deliver clean, reliable water and to prevent or reduce impacts of catastrophic forest fires and to mitigate impacts of floods and droughts um, in places like Quito, Nairobi, Denver, Mexico City, uh, among many other locations. And um, some of the core components of that are a really strong science foundation and establishment of sustainable financing and governance mechanisms so that we can implement those um, solutions at uh, watershed scale over time. Um, at the same time, working on sort of those longer term policy changes that help allow, support, and incentivize use of nature-based solutions. And in my role as a scientist, um, I focus on scientific research, collating data from on the ground projects to help clarify when and how specific nature-based solutions can help nature and people adapt to climate change, and also to help improve that um, innovation design and focus on um, providing guidance on how to account for those different benefits of nature-based solutions to help build that business case. And then finally, I do quite a bit of work engaging deeply with the private sector, um, who has been a leader in investments in nature-based solutions for water security and adaptation as part of their water risk mitigation and water stewardship portfolios. Um, and, and one way to do that is through corporate focused initiatives such as the Water Resilience Coalition and the Science-Based Target Network, where we utilize tools such as collective action and target setting for driving companies to more effectively invest in water resilient solutions, including nature-based solutions. Great, great. Thanks very much, Kari. Um, so I think you all can see that we have quite an interesting panel here and looking forward to getting to, to some questions. Um, because time is running a bit short, I think I will actually start with uh, questions from our audience here. Um, and I, I think you, you had a question or a comment? Yeah. No, thank you, um, and thank you for putting this panel together. I was reflecting, I, I work with Jan at Forest Trends, and I was reflecting a little bit on the, on the signal that's in this panel that's really different than, we would, than, than the panels we've had around this five years ago, 10 years ago. And, and it's really about the scaling aspect of this. So the program that we're involved with in Peru is a national program. We work in 20 watersheds in one, pla in one way. There are $250 million that are now committed by public agencies to support this. Again, that's a really important kind of signal of the scale of the opportunity here. Mumbai, obviously, a city of 14 million people, that's a very big deal. And then when you think about even um, our friend that was with the Army Corps, it's, it's an institutional shift that's happening. So these are all signals, in my mind, that that we're starting to get to the scale we're looking for. But I guess the, the issue that I have or the question that I keep wrestling myself with is the language we use, right? So many of us have spent our careers with um, ecosystem services, nature-based, whatever we want to call those things, right, that we love. But I think the progress, for instance, that we've made in a place like Peru is when we think about natural infrastructure. This is their language. This is the way they think about the threats that they're having from climate. And that is why we've been able to kind of turn that into an actual financing mechanism. So there is a tariff in the water sector, coming from the water sector that is earmarked for natural infrastructure. They don't call it nature-based solutions. They don't start there, they end up there with us. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I'm just, um, I'm thinking that that for me, that idea of language, right? We've got to package it correctly. And with that, we can use the instrument of finance to really bring about the changes because many of the challenges we see in the United States and in Costa Rica and the United States and, and Peru and places are really institutional, you know, legacies. They're the inertia of many different institutions involved in an issue in a way so they can't make any progress. But I think that financing signal is what gives us hope to go forward. So I think it's brilliant the way you've arrange this to really talk about those different scales and the initiatives that are driving the, the change that we need. Great. Yeah, I have to say, as a cultural anthropologist by training, thinking about language, thinking about putting it in the terms that, you know, the people who are involved understand and, and that resonate with them, I, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I do have a question that I think kind of builds on that um, for our panel. Um, and it's, it's about sort of 
you know, how do we capture benefits? Um, we know that the benefits of nature-based solutions for adaptation go far beyond what we can capture in normal cost-benefit analyses, right? You know, we heard return on investment, we heard private sector, but we know it has to go beyond that. And I wonder if any of our panelists have any ideas um, about what some of the, the most important methods for capturing, you know, we can call them co-benefits, we can call them additional benefits. Um, any thoughts on that? And I have to admit I'm not quite sure how to know who's raising their hand. <laughs> Hey, Rebecca, this is Zach. I'll jump in quickly Great, here. Thank you. You know, I, I think when putting these together and looking at co-benefits to us, there were really three things that stood out between the capital to do these projects and the ecosystem services or the positive benefit conferred by these projects. The first is obviously being able to, to really project from a scientific standpoint what is going to happen on the landscape and at the same time being able to credibly measure and verify on the back end after treatments take place what has happened for those stakeholders, right? And that to me is where the most important piece, the scientific innovation that actually unlocks all the financial innovation that we'll talk about um, on this panel happens. The next piece is how do you build a contract around that measurement verification, whether it's a cost share contract or pay for performance or pay for success, as you all probably heard a lot at this COP, that contracting piece is really the next piece. How do you make both your investors and your stakeholders or your groups that benefit comfortable with those contracts. And then what we've seen at Blue Forest, the third piece is how do you wrap all of this up into a financial vehicle that actually looks familiar to the investment community, right? How do we make natural infrastructure financially look like built infrastructure? And ultimately we wanna take novel and innovative financial structures like ones discussed here and make them boring because when they're boring, that's when the money really starts to come from that perspective. So that's how we think about it a little bit at Blue Forest and happy to kick this back to the panel. Great, thanks very much, Zach. Anyone else want to come in on this question? Hi, Rebecca, this is Kari. Go for um, it. Just wanted to say this is a really fantastic question because it's something that comes up a lot. Um, and I think what we found is that different types of actors need different types of information of, from the level of even just identifying those benefits to quantifying and then valuing those benefits. Um, and we don't always need to go full to, to the sort of the valuation, but for many sort of um, funders and financiers, um, we, we do need to get to that point. And I think some of the challenges around um, getting there have to do with um, like who is getting the benefits, um, where they're being delivered, sort of at what scale and when they're being delivered. So I think um, we have the instruments to calculate, you know, the, the dollar value of many of these kinds of benefits, but I think we need to continue doing work on answering some of those other questions. Um, and and um, yeah, we're engaged in, in some of that work around, for example, forecasting of benefits, the when, um, but I think there still needs to be a lot of work around the, the who and the where, sort of the scaling of those. Excellent points, and I, I certainly agree. Anyone else wanna come on in on that question? Um, or I can ask another one as we begin to wrap up. Maybe I can just add that in California, approximately 70% of the project funding come from local investments, 20 from the state and 10% from federal governments. And so our focus really is like, you know, to provide tools and methodology to the locals and figure out how we can motivate them and show the beneficial of the beneficial show of uh, integrated water management. I think, you know, the, the money is mostly coming from water supply and floods still now but really to show that by doing integrated water management and really pushing the natural uh, solution, these solutions really um, promote like, you know, the implementation of the project. And then by doing that, you're able to uh, scale up and, and get the, the state public benefits of the larger region as well. Um, I think that's very important. Great, thank you. My final question, I think we could have one or two people quickly chime in on this one, is about policies and regulations. Um, you know, we know that they can either bolster NBS for adaptation projects or they can halt them before they even have the chance to get started. Um, a successful NBS pro project requires government support as well as local engagement. And so the question is like, how do we create enabling questions to encourage both government support and local action and local engagement. Anyone want to come in on that? Perhaps I will take that. Um, so I believe it's very important that 
nature-based solution, ecosystem-based adaptation is also community-led. So like bottom-up approach seem to be very important. But at the same time, it's like a multi-level governance approach. Like we have to look at the policies uh, coming down from NDCs down to national policy documents and then see how can this be mainstreamed in at the local level. This is, this is again, has very different levels because we also have to work on strengthening capacity, capacities in planning and implementing. And here I see a linkage also to the question that we had before, because it comes again to scale. And one of the issues is often that the benefits of nature-based solutions can be seen on a longer term, while when we're looking at financing schemes, they're often on a shorter term. So how can we solve that? Looking at uh, reflecting ecosystem-based adaptation or nature-based solutions better in the planning the project planning processes in modeling tools could be could be very valuable also for um, for getting the evidence and the effectiveness of the nature-based solutions so including it in scenario modeling within the tools and approaches of also the risk industry in relevant decision making processes is um, in our experience something very very important to bring it up to scale uh, modeling can evaluate the performance under different future climate change scenarios and under uncertainty and is crucial for adaptation planning. And the data is there. I think the tools are there. And um, But having industry assessment recognizing these benefits of climate risk reduction can pos positively impact insurers, invest investors, and regulate this and bring it more up to scale. Thank you. Great, thank you, Astrid. And I can see here uh, at the Resilience Hub some movement towards the back, towards the next event. So I think that means our time is drawing to a close. Let me hand back to Craig Hansen for a few closing remarks. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Rebecca, and thank you all the panelists. Let's give a round of applause for Rebecca and the panelists. So this has been a, a really interesting, I know I personally have learned a lot uh, during today's session. I, I just want to walk out with three takeaways for us all. So first, I mean, clearly from the get-go in this, in this conversation till now is the apparent, you know, the need, the urgency for bridging these two communities, right? The MBS community and the adaptation community, right? And that what we heard during all the sessions is that both sides benefit by bridging, right? This is you know, these, the, the two shall meet, they need to meet, because both will benefit from engaging with the other. Secondly, is in making that bridging, it's really important to show the benefits. And we heard from all the case examples from Peru, all the way to the United States, to Costa Rica, et cetera, is the benefits to people, benefits to governments, you know, saving money, et cetera, you know, as well as the benefits of nature. But we gotta communicate those social benefits if you're gonna get the political buy-in, because I like to say, People vote, nature doesn't, right? So we gotta be able to communicate those benefits. And finally, we have to communicate the successes. I mean, I didn't know about most of these examples here. I knew about the blue, the, the blue forest one, but that's about it, right? And I, I work on this stuff. And so getting the stories out, I think is super, super important because in my view, success breeds success, right? And it inspires other people. So we gotta, I think it's incumbent on us here, the panelists and others to actually be much more vocal and much more public about the progress and the examples here, because that will actually drive greater and greater adoption of this. So with that, I wanna thank you all. Good luck with your work and helping making the bridging these two communities a reality. Uh, and thank you, Rebecca. Let's give a round of applause for Rebecca who pulled all this thing together. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.